Say the words hot hatch and the first names that leap to mind are probably Golf, i30N and Honda Civic Type R. But Toyota Corolla? Here's why you should add that name to the list. I'm Alex Dalrymple, this is Four Wheels in a Seat and it's a channel where you can see new cars reviewed every week. Have you hit subscribe yet though? Can you do that for me please? Just click that little button down below. Give me a like as well, thank you very much, I appreciate it. The GR Corolla is a curious beast. I reviewed the stock standard Corolla about a year ago. You can check out that review by clicking the link just up there. And while it's a really good car to drive, it doesn't exactly inspire thoughts of performance, but it is like day and night comparing the regular Corolla to this thing. It is a completely different car to drive. Although it looks a bit more bulbous and aggressive than a regular Corolla, it actually shares more panels with the normal car than a lot of the other hot hatches do with their normal versions. For example, the flared bits here on the back door and on the rear quarter panel are actually just bolted on. But up here on top of the bonnet, we do get two air scoops that are active and allow the engine to breathe a bit better. And although the lower grille there looks big and mean and aggressive, it's actually still about the same size as the regular Corolla. The front fenders have been flared out to make room for some fatter, wider track tyres. This car's got 18 inch black rims wrapped in Yokohama rubber and I actually really like that design. Big disc brakes in there to help this car come to a stop in a very short distance with big red brake calipers. Active air vents here on the fender too to improve airflow. We've got a nice little GR badge there. At the back of the GR Corolla, we get not one, not two, but three exhausts. One on either side, one in the middle. Interesting design, I actually quite like it. The rear bumper here is again a little bit bigger than the regular one. We get the GR badging there, so you know what car it is that you're pulled up behind. And under the tailgate here is a not very big boot space, if I'm honest. Again, Toyota don't quote the exact size of it on their spec sheet, but take my word for it, it's not huge. And that's mainly because of this big plasticky polystyrene style storage box thing that's under the floor that uh, houses your tyre repair kit as well as the battery which sits back here rather than up in the engine bay. Under the bonnet we've got the same engine here in the GR Corolla that is found in the much smaller GR Yaris. It's a 1.6 litre three cylinder turbo that outputs 221 kilowatts of power and 370 newton metres of torque. It's a bigger car, it needs a bigger output. Toyota don't give a zero to 100 time on their official spec sheet, but a quick Google suggests that it's 5.2 seconds and fuel economy averages at 8.4 litres per 100 kilometres on a combined cycle around town. The interior of the GR Corolla is pretty much the same as the regular Corolla in terms of design, but there are a few key differences, most notably the software running on the center console screen. This is the all new software that was first seen in the Corolla Cross and it is so much better, a vast improvement over the old system. It's really nice and simple to use. There's wireless Apple CarPlay, although sorry, Android users, you're gonna have to stick with a USB cable for a little while longer and it's connected to an eight speaker JBL sound system, which sounds really good. You can also design customizable drive modes using this system, although it does lack some of the hardcore track monitoring functions like lap times and race maps and that kind of thing that you find in the i30N and the Honda Civic Type R. Climate controls are kept completely separate. They're not run through the system at all, which I know a lot of people are a fan of, so you don't have to fiddle around with the screen when you're trying to change the temperature or turn the fan on and off. Underneath that, we've got wireless phone charging, seat heating controls, the drive mode selector. The gear shifter is nice. It's just not quite as nice to use as the Type R's and the throws are just maybe a little bit longer perhaps. Having said that though, this car is a lot harder to stall than the GR86 I reviewed a few weeks ago. So it uh, is a much easier car to live with as a daily driver in that sense. Just next to that, we've got a little dial here that allows you to adjust the amount of torque going to all four wheels because this, unlike the Civic and the i30, is an all-wheel drive car. Big handbrake here with a nice uh, leather stitching on it and a, a good feel. Um, there's no armrest in this car, which I guess they do so that you know, you're know you not gonna knock it with your elbow when you're changing gears frantically, but me being a little bit taller and having a bit more clearance, I'm really missing not having anywhere to rest my elbow. Also, there's no storage here either, apart from just this little open tray. Uh, the USB-C port here, as well as a 12 volt outlet. 
The digital instrument cluster is different to any other one I've seen in a Toyota lately, and I really like it. There's two distinctive display modes, normal and sport. You can also customize the widgets on either side. I really like having the turbo boost gauge there on the right, and as it flies up and down as you accelerate, it looks uh, really cool. You can even display maps on here as well, although they're not very detailed. It's just literally pictures of streets with no names. Steering wheel, yeah, it's a good size, has a nice feel as far as actually being well weighted, but in terms of the materials used, it just, I don't know, feels a little bit cheap, not quite as special as, say, the i30N or the uh, Civic Type R, but it does the job. Lots of controls on here for the sound system and uh, cruise controls. The seats are very comfortable racing buckets done in suede with leather accents. Um, there is no electric control though, unfortunately. It's only manual and they are heated, but not ventilated. Having said that though, the seating position is really good in the cabin. I've got uh, plenty of headroom and I'm feeling kind of nice and low and sporty. Visibility out the front, yeah, not quite so good. I think it's just because I'm so low in the cabin, I can't quite see to the front of the car, but there are front parking sensors which make it a little bit easier. Good visibility through the rear vision mirror and the wing mirrors are a nice big size too. And checking out the back seat <laughs> of the Corolla and um, look, as expected, it's not great for somebody my size. I'm 190 centimetres tall, knees right into the back of the seat in front of me in my own driving position. Headroom is actually better than I thought it would be. Hair just sort of touching the ceiling there. I've got an armrest with cup holders, uh, some nice leather and suede seats, and the seating position's actually fairly comfortable. Um, the one USB-C port though could be a bit of an issue for families and that's actually one USB-C port for the entire car so amongst five people they can fight amongst themselves for that. Um, but having said that though I mean this car isn't really designed with backseat passengers in mind if I'm honest it's really all about the driver. As I mentioned before, Toyota don't quote the 0 to 100 time of this car on their official specs sheet, but if you do a bit of a search on Google, you can find other people who've done it in 5.2 seconds. So let's give that a go and see what that's like. <laughs> Got a little bit friendly with the rev limiter there, but that was really good. Makes a nice noise and for a three cylinder engine, um, this thing really moves. So really compared to other hot hatches, you'd have a really hard time knowing that this car has one less cylinder in the engine and it's 400cc smaller. It is so good. And I have to keep reminding myself that this is a Corolla. It doesn't drive anything like any other Corolla I've ever driven. It is just so lively. The ride on this car is certainly on the firmer side and this uh, particular stretch of freeway I'm on is, uh, well, there's quite a few potholes on it actually, I've just noticed, and there's a lot of uh, bumps in the road and I'm pretty much feeling every one of them and it's sort of giving us a fairly firm ride. The suspension is not adaptive, so you get what you get and you don't get upset. Safety gear is okay. This car does miss a few things because after all it is really designed as a track car more than a daily driver. But we do have things like front and rear parking sensors, there's forward collision warning and blind spot monitors in the wing mirrors. Overall, the experience of driving this car is kind of like the price. It's smack bang in between the i30N and the Honda Civic Type R with the i30 being sort of really an out and out performance machine for the track and that exhaust that pops and crackles and the ride is pretty firm. Creature comforts are a little bit thin on the ground. This car is definitely a step up from that but it's not quite at the same level as the Honda Civic Type R which really is the most refined of all of them and probably the easiest to live with uh, as a daily driver. There is a little button just down here on my right labelled IMT. That stands for Intelligent Manual Transmission. Basically, it's rev matching the engine for smoother downshifting if you're not really great at doing heel and toe, which is something I've never really quite been able to master. But the other thing that separates this car from those other two hot hatches that I've been mentioning a lot lately is the fact that this one is all-wheel drive and you can even adjust the amount of torque going to the front and rear axles 
with the uh, dial down here on the lower console. At the moment I've got it set at 60-40 with 60% of the power and torque going to the rear wheels, 40 at the front, but you can adjust that and the car behaves very differently on the track, especially when you're throwing it into a corner really hard. It's a really unusually warm day for this time of year and I cannot fault the air conditioning in this car. It is freezing in here, which is just the way I like it when it's uh, 34 degrees outside right now. I've always had a bit of a thing for Corollas because mainly I learned how to drive on a Corolla when I was 16 years old. It was a Toyota Corolla Seeker way back in 1994. That's a long time ago. Um, and they have always lived up to that reputation of being reliable and safe and solid and well made and running forever but never really cars to get your pulse racing until now because this the gr corolla is something else The GR Corolla might not be the most obvious choice when it comes to selecting a hot hatch, but at $69,000 it sits smack bang between the Hyundai i30N and the Honda Civic Type R, and it has performance that matches both of them, plus it's all-wheel drive. So for those reasons, I think it's well worth taking one for a test drive.